Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for your people. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for bringing us together. We pray, Lord, we will not study in vain in Jesus' name. We pray for all our brothers and sisters and all the invitees in all the places we are sharing the Bible study together. We are asking, O oh Lord, you will touch every life and turn us around in Jesus' name. Lead us to definite decision that will make our Christian life better. And those who have not known the Lord, today will be their day of decision to know the Lord in Jesus' name. And for us who are ministers and workers, we pray you open our eyes to see the importance of the ministry you have given unto us and to do it faithfully and to do it profitably that many souls will be won into your kingdom in Jesus' name. Bless everyone tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. God bless everyone. You can sit down. We have been studying from the gospel according to St. Mark. And today we are coming to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. We are reading from verse 34 all through to verse 38. That's the passage of study tonight. Mark chapter 8, reading from verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him, talking about Jesus, he called the people unto him with his disciples also. He said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's sake, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of the Father with the holy angels. As you have heard those verses that were read, you have seen what the Lord is talking about. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. He's talking to everyone. He's talking to the sage and talking to the sinner. Look at verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The Lord is talking about a most precious possession. And tonight, the title of the message is The Great Value of a Most Precious Possession. A Most Precious Possession. What's the value? That's what he's talking about tonight. And in that central verse, in verse 36, it says, What shall he profit a man? What shall he profit a woman? What shall he profit? A man, a woman in this world, if it were possible for him to gain the whole world and then to lose his own soul. Then he continues in verse 37 and he says, And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What he's telling us tonight, he wants us to think about. He wants us to turn it over in our mind and apply it personally to everyone of our lives who are here at the Bible study. Don't allow the Bible study to just be one of those things. I always come. I'm always there. I'm always reading the Bible. Let the word tonight sink into your heart and think about what Jesus is saying. And he's asking you a question. And you need to think about the question the Lord is asking you. The question is, as we put everything, paraphrase the question, what is your most precious possession? Think about your life and think about your surroundings. What is your most precious possession? What are the possessions that you have? Temporal, 
some are eternal the possession of earthly gain is that the most important thing to you the possession of material wealth is that the most important thing to you the possession of personal profit personal progress personal prosperity or worldly position political position or material position whatever it is academic position of the greatest prosperity anyone can think about or your personal desirable thing that you hold on very tightly to is that your most precious possession all those things are temporary and they are temporal and they will pass away with time the possession of the whole world if it were possible will not compensate for the loss of your soul and for the loss of any man's soul that's why jesus christ asked the question and said for what shall he profit a man i should make it personal what will it profit you if you were to gain the whole world and lose your soul the soul of man is his greatest possession. All the things we gain on earth, we're going to leave behind. The money, the wealth, the prosperity, the interactions, the connections, anything on earth that we have, we're going to leave everything behind. And when that final day comes for you to leave this world, the thing you are going to take away with you that will never pass away, that will never die, is your soul. And so you want to think about that and make sure that your soul is well prepared and you want to make that so ready and very valuable. How is your soul going to be valuable? It must be quickened, must be saved. It must be restored if you have gone astray. If you are not in the right way, the narrow way that leads to heaven, it must be restored and renewed. It must be purged. Purged from all sin. Purged from all evil. Purged from all iniquity. Anything that will hinder that soul spending eternity with God in heaven, that soul must be purged and purified. Your soul must be secured, secured in Christ, in fellowship with Christ abiding in Christ and kept secured until the final day. You need preparation then. You need preservation then. And you need to be ready so that when that day comes and your chance comes, you'll get to heaven. I pray you'll get to heaven. Yeah. Don't throw away your soul, your most precious possession, on the rubbish heap of the world. Don't throw away your most precious possession, your life, your heart, your destiny. Don't toss it to the devil and don't throw it away on the rubbish heap of the world. Make sure that the question Jesus Christ is asking, you are able to answer that question and you say, I know my greatest profit. I know that my greatest possession, I know that my greatest desire is to have my soul saved for that wonderful day. Look at the verse 36 again. For what shall it profit a man? He was talking to every disciple. What shall it profit a disciple? He was talking to every church goer. What shall it profit a church goer? He was talking to every neighbor and everyone in the community. What shall it profit anyone if that one will gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man, what were you in particular? And what will your friends in particular, what will any member of our church, any member of any church in particular, what can he give in exchange for his soul? As I said tonight, we're speaking on and studying on the great value of our most precious possession. The great value of our most precious possession. As we look at these verses, we're going to divide to three parts. Number one, his incontestable word on our enduring salvation. It's talking about her salvation. He said, if you're following me, you make up your mind, you turn away from the world, and you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. You repent of your sin. You rely on him. You believe on the Lord with the faith that gets your soul saved. Our salvation, enduring salvation, our salvation, abiding salvation, 
as salvation is salvation a kind of salvation that is not just okay i feel good i feel this i feel that you become a new creature in christ and you are totally changed and you have enduring salvation and then he gives us an incontestable word concerning that that means something indisputable that means something you know, that nobody can argue against this is the incontestable word on an enduring salvation. Look at that in verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, whosoever will believe on me as Savior, come after me as Savior, rely on me as Savior, and follow me and not follow darkness anymore, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, that's his word, on a salvation, deny himself, and take up his cross, that's his word, on a salvation that is enduring. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And uh, follow me. When you get saved, if you get saved and you understand what salvation means, it means you are following the Lord. You are following his steps. You are following his life. And you are following his word until you get to heaven. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will protect his life. My friends must not hear. My family must not hear. My neighbors must not hear. My office people must not hear that I have abandoned the ways of the world and I'm following the Lord all right. Whosoever will save his life and protect his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's sake, whosoever will say, I don't care what they think. I don't care what they do. I don't care how they act. I don't care about their ridicule. I don't care about their jesting. I am going to follow the Lord at any cost, at every cost. Such a person, the same shall save it and save it to eternity. Point number one then, the incontestable word on our enduring salvation. Point number two. Point number two you find in verse 36 the incomparable worth of your eternal soul. Your, the incomparable worth of your eternal soul. You have a soul. That's why you are alive. You have a soul. That's why you are moving about. You have a soul. That's how you can think. That's why you are hearing me now. That's why you can understand the word of God. You have a soul. A soul to be saved. That's why Jesus came into this world. And that soul is the most important. In fact, the word of God tells us that God made man in his own image. And then he breathed unto him the breath of life. And man became a living soul. That breath that came from God, eternal, as eternal as God is, will never die. The body will die. And the body will go back to the grave, but the soul will go to God and go and answer for everything he has done. He's talking about that soul and he says, what shall he profit a man if he shall gain the world and lose his own soul? You understand that? There are many people that do not understand when a period of probation, God sent us into this world, not just to amass wealth, not just to fill our belly and not just to have uh, sand and cement and to have material things. He, he brought us into this world so we can prepare for eternity. And there are many people that have forgotten that. They have forgotten that we are here to prepare for eternity. And so they lose their souls. They forget about their souls. They don't think about their souls and they do not prepare to make sure that their soul gets to heaven. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? His own soul. Everybody has one. Everybody has a soul. A soul to be saved. A soul to get to heaven. A soul to avoid hell. And a soul to be in relationship with the Almighty God forever and ever. His own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Point number two then. The incomparable worth of your eternal soul. Point number three. Our incommutable watchfulness against everlasting shame. Our incommutable, when you say commute, 
that means to interchange or something. But this one now, a kind of watchfulness that is incommutable. A kind of uh, uh, watchfulness that is unchangeable. A kind of watchful, watchfulness that is not interchangeable with any other thing. That means then, any other quality you have, any other characteristic you have, you are this, you are this, you are that, this word incommutable watchfulness means that that watchfulness must always be in your life. Why? Well, because there's a Satan, there's a devil, there are demons, and there are people that wants to snatch your soul from you and drag that soul to hell. That's why you are watchful and you cannot interchange that watchfulness with anything. Look at chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 38 in verse 38 whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the son of man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his father with the holy angels you will not be ashamed of the Lord I will not be ashamed of the Lord. Look at this, whosoever. And these are the words of Jesus. And he says, whosoever. He might brag in the church. He might have bold face in the church. But when he gets to the world, he's ashamed of Christ. He cannot stand for the salvation he has. He cannot stand for the conviction he has. And over there... They push him and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Are you not a Christian? Uh, not really. He's ashamed of the Lord in the world. And God says, the Lord Jesus says, Whosoever, whosoever, whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father and of the holy angels. I will not be ashamed of the Lord. I said, I will not be ashamed of the Lord. Let's come back to point number one. Point number one, we're talking about the incontestable word on our enduring salvation. Our salvation, an enduring salvation. Our salvation, an abiding salvation. Our salvation, a permanent salvation. Our salvation is salvation we embrace and we keep and we do not allow anything or anyone to take it away from us. Mark chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, he said unto his disciples, those who already saved, and he said unto the rest of the people, even those who are not saved, he said, Whosoever will come after me, let him, number one, deny himself. Number two, take up his cross. Number three, follow me. That's how our salvation will endure. You get saved. That's not enough. That you, that's the first step. That's the first decision. Now you must make sure that that salvation abides and that salvation endures. And this is the incontestable word of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Any theologian can say anything. Any preacher can say anything. Any bishop or any shepherd can say anything. But this is the word of Jesus Christ our Lord. And it is incontestable. It is indisputable. He said, if we're going to keep that salvation, if that salvation is going to endure, if that salvation is going to abide, there are three things. Number one, there will be self-denial. Number two, there will be taking up the cross. Number three, will be following Christ. I'm going to put them like this. Number one, is command to deny self. Is command to deny self. Number two, I put that like this, the carrying 
of our cross shamelessly. You see, there are people, if they have any challenge, any cross to bear, any kind of persecution or any need in their lives, and that happens to be the cross at that time, before the Lord removes it, they are ashamed. How can I say I belong to Christ? How can I read the Bible? How can I go to the Bible study? How can I worship on Sunday? How can I say, how can I declare I'm a child of God? Look at the cross, look at the cross. But you know, if your salvation is going to abide, you must carry your cross shamelessly. Number three, the call to follow his steps. The call to follow his steps. Look at that. Look at those things one by one. I'm reading from the start before again. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself. Are there things that come to your life? And what the Lord is expecting when that temptation comes, when that trial comes, when that challenge or difficulty comes, when there is something that wants to stop your journey, what the Lord is expecting is to think of your salvation. Any sin that will take my salvation from me, any sin that will take my confidence in the Lord from me, any sin that will take away that abiding nature of my salvation, any sin, any sin, whatever, I will deny myself. That's what the Lord is saying in Matthew chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 16, we're looking at verse 24. It says, it then said, Jesus unto his disciples, If any man, whosoever in Mark, any man in Matthew, that means you. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. You see that? Let him deny himself. What does that mean to deny himself? You remember when Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ. He indulged himself and he denied Christ. What does it mean to deny Christ? I don't know him. I don't know what you are talking about. I don't belong to him. I say no to what you are saying. You say I belong to him. I say no. What does it mean then to deny yourself? To say no to self. Self wants you to do this and that thing will get you into sin you say no self wants you to act in a particular way and that will show the nature of satan and the nature of evil you say no actually as you look at everything number one it means deny self say no to self number two be deaf to self self is saying hey i want you to do this I want you to do that. I want you to kind of disorganize your life. I want you to become unrighteous. I want you to become unholy. I want you to have the pleasures of the flesh and satisfy yourself and dishonor the Lord. You are deaf to self. You act as if you are not hearing. It's just like somebody calls you and you don't want to answer. You don't want to go that direction and you are deaf to that person. It also means, number three, to disobey self. Self is giving you a commandment. And that commandment and that instruction is going to make you dishonor Christ and disregard Christ. You say, no, Christ is number one in my life. Self cannot be number one. And if I'm going to be the Savior, I must disobey self. Do you ever do that? Self wants you to do something. Self wants to, you to act something out. And that thing will not please the Lord. And that thing will not go well down for the Lord. And that thing will not uh, make you to be a favorite child of God. Do you disobey self? That's what it means. To deny self is to disobey self. It also means, number four, to discipline self. You know, self would like to be careless. Self would like to run here, run there. Self would like to have self-will. Would like to do whatever, anytime, anywhere. And when self wants you to misbehave, and self wants you to do anything that is not according to the will of God, you discipline self. You know, 
if some people discipline self, like they discipline other people, like they think of stopping other people, that they think like uh, making other people not to do that, and they say, I'm not going to take nonsense from anybody, and therefore I discipline that person. You know, if you turn that around and you discipline self, Self wanting you to go out of the narrow way and go to the broad way. Self wanting you to do something that is not according to the will of God. You say, you know what, self, you're not going to take salvation from me. You're not going to take eternal life from me. I deny you. I am deaf to you. I am dumb to you. I disobey you. I discipline you. It means when you say you deny self, you dominate self. Dominate self. You have authority over that self. You are not going to allow self to dominate you. You have had the word of God. And self wants you to push aside the scripture. And push aside the savior. And push aside all the doctrines of the word of God. That you know every good thing we have learned from the word of God. Now that we are new creatures in Christ. All things pass away. All things become new. And self wants us to disregard all that. And pay attention to only self. To say no, I dominate self. You know what it means to deny self? Diminish self. Diminish self. You know, self likes to be on the ivory tower. Self likes to be on the throne of your heart. And self likes to be the one that is recognizing. Self wants to have the joy of controlling you, of being the steering wheel in your life. You say, I diminish that thing. You say, no. You cut down the power of self. You say, I can't do that. I won't do that. You cut down the power of self. You diminish self. And then you constantly, wholeheartedly die to self. Die to self. It's like self is dead. And I don't recognize it. I don't recognize the authority of a dead man. I don't recognize the authority of a dead woman. We might have been close. We might have been together. It might have been that that master, he was my master. He was the one dominating me. Now he's dead. And I don't recognize the, the, the authority of that dead personality. Self must die. And when self dies, you don't recognize the authority of self anymore. I belong to the Lord. You belong to the Lord. And the Lord will make you to overcome self in your life in Jesus' name. Did I get any amen from the church? Mark chapter 8. And I'm reading here from verse 34. Mark chapter 8, reading from verse 34. It says in verse 34, And when he had called the people unto him, with the disciples also he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Let him deny himself and take up his cross. Everyone has a cross to bear. The pastor has a cross to bear. The minister has a cross to bear. And this is what happens. You know, there are people that think that once I come into, ministry, into the ministry, everybody will be honoring me, uh, regarding me, appreciating me, and saying nice, nice words unto me. They're saying he is the one that brings to all the word of salvation. And so we love him, we respect him, we exalt him you'll be disappointed. There are people that do not have that kind of honor and that kind of exaltation. You have the cross to bear. And when you are pushed down, when they should have respected you, and when you are pushed aside, when they should have recognized you, don't feel hurt. The Lord already told you there is a cross to bear. You are a Christian. You are born again now. Your life is new. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And then you get to your office. So you get home and you think everybody is going to really know now I am an angel of a man. 
an angel of a woman because you know in the past I used to you know tell them lies I used to fight with them I used to get angry I used to do this and that and uh, you know at that time they knew I was a tough man a tough woman but now I'm born again I'm meek I'm gentle I'm lowly I'm loving I'm humble I'm following the footsteps of Christ and then they're going to appreciate me and they're going to honor me and persecution comes and disagreement comes and you see, he's gone to join religion. He's gone to take religion. Religion has got into it. He said, men bust your for family. May even do that. That is the time, you understand, there's a cross to bear. And he says, if we're following the Lord and the salvation is going to be genuine, we bear our cross. Have you heard of some people? They say they are Christians, and then their wives too are Christians, and they have a little problem at home, a little disagreement at home. And the man is saying, I cannot bear that. How can my wife do that to me, and my wife say that to me? They have forgotten that is the cross. And now they say, I'm going to separate. I'm not going to live with this woman anymore. They are not carrying their cross. But you know, if we're going to get saved, and if we're going to keep saved, we must bear our cross that that same wife you're nice to her you're good to her because you're a child of God but somebody who says I'm a Christian I'm born again and is already contemplating divorce I'm going to leave the woman I'm going to go to the court we're going to divide everything you take this part of the house I take that part of the house and then you take these children if we have girls you can take the girls I'm going to take the boys what is the bearing of the cross? You see, that's what the Lord is telling us. He's telling us that if we're really saved and born again, number one, you deny self. Self would like to assert itself. And self would like to say, I will control you. Self will not control me. Amen. Self will not control you. Amen. And then there is a cross to bear. You will bear your cross. Amen. By prayer, you will bear the cross. Yeah. With faith, you will bear the cross. Yeah. With grace, you will bear the cross. Yeah. Listen to me. There is nothing those three elements combined together cannot endure. Grace, faith, prayer can endure anything. Can carry any load. Because God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And so you'll bear your cross in the Holy Ghost, in the power of the Holy Ghost. And people don't understand, why do I have the Holy Ghost? How do I say I'm born again, I'm sanctified, and I have the power of the Holy Ghost? It's so that you can bear any cross and carry any load. Because now your faith is multiplied, the grace is multiplied, and your prayer is dynamic in the Holy Ghost. Not only that, you have boldness and courage. Boldness and courage. If you say you're a Christian, a, a Christian is different from the people of the world that's afraid of everything. Afraid of the wind blowing. Afraid of a cockroach that is, you know, passing by. Afraid of the catch at the window. Afraid of this. Afraid of that. No. When you come to Christ, some of the things that pass away, the timidity and the fear, and the trembling, and you know, the regret, all that is gone from your life in Jesus' name. Yeah. Now, there is boldness. Yeah. I say there is boldness. Yeah. And there is courage. If you have courage, you say, I cannot carry my load. You say, how heavy that load is. Some people that went before me, they carried their load. And they carried all their luggages. And so me now, with the boldness and the courage, I will carry my load. I said I will carry my load. There are people who are parasites. They lean on other people every time. Hey, other people have loads to carry to you. Other people have their crosses to carry to you. And you're always calling so-and-so, calling so-and-so. Brother, I have a cross. Brother, I have a load. Brother, I have a mountain. They have their crosses to you. And they have their mountains to you. But now from tonight, courage will come into you. Power will come into you. That cross, you will bear it. 
and you will carry it without compromise. You see what makes people to compromise is that, well, this cross is heavy. And the people that make that cross heavy and heavier, every heavier every day, they have assured me that if I don't change, they're going to make the cross heavier. And so, okay, what can I do now? I need to cut corners. I need to compromise. I need to chip out a little, chicken out a little, so that they will know that, okay, I'm obeying you now. I'm no more obeying Jesus. I'm no more obeying my Savior. I'm not thinking of heaven anymore now. You are the center of my life now, and I'm thinking about you. Can you help me a little and lessen my cross? That's compromise. I will not compromise. I said I will not compromise. And then you are carrying the cross in his service. In his service. The service of the Lord is not a bed of roses. There are challenges you will bear. There are difficulties that will come your way. But you say, I will serve the Lord. The cross may be heavy. I will serve the Lord. The cross may be so pinching on my shoulder, on my head. I will serve the Lord. You will serve the Lord. Somebody there said you will serve the Lord. How can we bear the cross? How can we take up the cross and never allow any sin to make us disregard our salvation? Bearing the cross all the time. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, look at verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It's the one that gave us the faith. And because we believe in the Lord, we have faith in Christ, we have salvation. That's why the cross has come. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He endured the cross for our salvation. He endured the cross for eternal life. If he endured that cross, you will never have any cross that's as heavy as the cross of Jesus Christ that he bought for you. If he endured for me, I will endure for him. I will endure for him. And then it says, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's come back to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, there are three items there, three elements there on our enduring salvation. As the salvation will abide and remain. It says in verse 34, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and tell me, follow me. Point number three there now is the call to follow his steps. The call to follow his steps. And any, any condition in which you are, you will ask yourself, what would Jesus do in this condition? My relatives are calling me and they are telling me to do something contrary to the word of God and contrary to the will of God. The question is, what will Jesus do? He will remember his father in heaven. He will obey his father in heaven. He will say, I always do those things that please him. And if any Pharisee, if any Sadducee, if any relative, if any townsman wants him to do something that is not according to the will of the father, he will say no. And he says, that's exactly how you are to live. Let him follow me. You will follow the Lord. Amen. Look at first um, Peter. First Peter, I'm reading from chapter 2, from verse 21. First Peter, chapter 2, verse 21. For even here unto were ye called? Here is our calling. Some people say, I don't know my calling. Here is your calling. Even here on you, were ye called? Because Christ also suffered for us. Christ also suffered for us. Leaving us an example. The reason he suffered is to save us. 
And the reason he suffered is to lay a standard before us and to say, look at the way I did it and look at what I did. And now that you say you are my follower and now that you say you are saved and now that you say that I am your Lord, your master, your king and your savior, I've left you an example that he should follow his steps. That he should follow his steps. Following the Lord sometimes will contradict what your relatives want because your relatives may not have the full knowledge of the calling of God upon your life. But then when there's any contradiction like that and Christ is standing on one side, your relatives are standing on the other side. Who are you to follow? I said you are you to follow? The Lord Jesus Christ. Look at uh, Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 59. Luke chapter 9, verse 59. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first. Me first. That's self right there. Me first. I have an, I have an engagement. I have an assignment. I have a duty. I have a responsibility. I have a commitment already. And I want to put that first wants to put whatever belongs to you, humanly speaking, first, and you bring Christ second, you are telling him it's not as important as those things you are putting forth. But if you are going to follow the Lord, when he said, follow me, you will not say, Lord, suffer me, permit me, allow me to go and bury my father. That's the first thing on my plate now. That's the first thing in my agenda now. Look at verse 60. Jesus said unto him, tell me somebody there. Let the dead bury their dead. Hold on. That's something uh, the people of the world will fight with you uh, for. They say, are you in town? Did you hear that Mr. So-and-so died? Yes, I heard. Did you hear that Madam So-and-so died? Yes, I heard. What were you doing? We had a church program at that time. You should have asked me before you fix that time. And because I had that engagement belonging to Christ, Christ is number one. What do you mean? You don't have a family. You don't think of your family. And church is number one. Bible is number one. Doctrine is number one. Following after the Lord is number one. You say, yes, that's my commitment. They're going to fight for that. And then you say, let me give you a verse of scripture that makes me to act the way I'm acting. They say, we don't want Bible. What we're talking about is you must be reasonable. There is no religion that will make you to put uh, any other thing forth and not put your family and not put so and so forth. That's what Jesus said. He said, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. That's who we are. That's what we do. That's what we will keep on doing. We're following the Lord. Whatever the cost, we'll keep on following the Lord. I'm looking at John chapter 21. John chapter 21 and i'm reading from verse 20 john chapter 21 we're looking at verse 20 then peter turning about sees uh, the disciple whom jesus lord following which also leaned on his breast at supper and said lord which is he that betrays thee and peter seeing him says to jesus Lord, what shall this man do? You see, there are many people, before they actually follow the Lord, and before they make all their commitments, that they will follow the Lord without fear, without favor, without compromise, and without any kind of turning around. They are asking, but you know, uh, Pastor so-and-so came to the Lord before me. I remember uh, Sister so-and-so followed up on me when I became a Christian. And if the Lord is challenging me, I hear the Bible study. I hear the Word of God. I hear what 
the Lord is putting before me, follow me. But what shall this man do? What shall this woman do? Am I the only one to carry on the Lord? Am I the only one to be faithful? Am I the only one to diligently follow? After everything we're learning, that's what Peter said. Seeing John, John the Beloved, come in, he said, Lord, what shall this man do? Look at verse 22. Jesus says unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Tell me the rest. Follow thou me. No comparison. What shall this man do? What shall this woman do? What will the brother do? What will the sister do? All those people, I'm not the only worker. All those other workers, I come to the Saturday workers meeting and I look around and I cannot find so and so. Am I the only one? Okay, next uh, Saturday, I think uh, these people are taking care of their personal businesses and they're taking care of that. I am going to also slow down. Ah, what is that to be? Follow thou me. You will follow follow the Lord. I will follow the Lord. I will not follow a stranger. I will not follow a backslider. There are people who are, you know, drawing back and drawing back and drawing back. And uh, it's like they're setting themselves for you as a standard. I am drawing back. Why don't you draw back? No, I don't, I'm not going to draw back. I am kind of compromising. Why don't you compromise? I'm not going to compromise. Look at John chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 5. John chapter 10, reading from verse 5. It says, And a stranger will they not follow. I will not follow a stranger. But they will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Let's come back now to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, we're coming to point number 2. In point number 2, we're talking about the incomparable worth of your eternal soul. The incomparable wars of your eternal soul. Let's look at Mark chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 36 to verse 37. Mark chapter 8, verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul. As you look at those two verses, number one, the great worth of your soul. The great worth of your soul. Number two, the grievous waste of lost souls. Lost souls are wasted. They have wasted the opportunity. They have wasted their chance. They have wasted the possibility of getting saved. The opportunity was there. The possibility was there. The chance was there. But they are lost. The grievous waste of lost souls. Number three, the gracious wealth for liberated souls. Number one, the great worth of your soul. Why is the soul so precious? Why is the soul so great? In the sight of God, we're looking at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 7. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. That's why it's so worthy. That's why it's so great. That's why it's so precious. It came from God. And it is as eternal as God himself is eternal. Psalm 49. In Psalm 49, we're reading from verse 7. Psalm 49, reading from verse 7. None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him for the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceases forever the redemption of the soul is precious and nobody could give anything for the redemption of that soul how worthy 
How valuable, how precious is the soul? Number one, the soul is greater than the whole world. If it were possible for you to gain the whole world and then to lose your soul, the loss will be terrible and painful. Why? Because the soul is greater than the whole world. Number two, because the soul is greater than all the precious things on earth. What people are running after, what people appreciate, and what people give up their lives for, and they sacrifice their lives for, your soul is more precious than all the things on earth. Number three, because the soul is greater than all the wealth, all the money, and all the banks of the world. There are some people that will say they love money so much, and the church is not preaching enough about prosperity. And because of that, they're thinking they only talk about salvation, about sanctification, about holiness, without which no man shall save the Lord. I think I want to find out a church where they'll talk about money and where they'll give me money to start my trade and to start my business. Even if you could find a church like that, but you must remember those people to have their members. And those people too have some poor people among them. They have some needy people among them. But even if they could give you something, your soul is more important than all the wealth in the world. Number four, the soul is greater than all the position and privileges you could have in the world. It looks like they're too slow over here to make me a pastor, to make me an overseer, and to make me to have this position, that privilege. Well... We're looking at the qualifications in the Word of God, but I know a place where even somebody junior to me, he left this place and went there and already is a pastor, already is an overseer, already is a bishop. Well, the soul is greater than all the position and the privilege in the world. Not only that, number five, the soul is greater than your body, your belly, and the pleasures of the body. Your people, all they're looking for pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. The pleasure of the flesh and the pleasure of the body. Your soul is greater than the body. Your soul is greater than your belly. Your soul is greater than the pleasures of the body. Number six, the soul is greater than the favor and the frowns of all men. Some people cannot bear, they cannot endure favor. Somebody shows them a little kindness. Who they say, look at this. That's an unbeliever. That's a sinner. And look at the favor he has shown me. And so they turn and they bend towards that man because of that favor. They throw their soul to the man. They say, if you can give me that kind of favor, I love you, I appreciate you so much. I'm so grateful. I throw my soul into your hand. Your soul is greater than all the favor of all the men of the world. Other people cannot bear the frowns of men. Somebody frowns at them. And, uh, you know, they say, what am I going to do now? Because I want love. I want affection. I want appreciation. I can't endure rejection. If they have rejected me and they are frowning at me, what can I do? I will bend. I will turn around. You're selling your soul. Stand your conviction honestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints the frowns of men will not change your life Amen. your soul is great enough for Christ to purchase with his own blood he didn't purchase the planets of the world he didn't purchase the sun and the moon and all the planets were read about with his blood but your soul is so great your soul is so valuable. Your soul is so precious that he gave his own blood. That's the reason why he will not allow anything to be an exchange for our soul. You'll keep that soul. you appreciate that soul. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body and are not able to kill the soul. Fear not them which kill the body and they're not able to kill the soul. Always remember, whatever they kill, 
your soul is greater than that. Whatever they take away, your soul is greater than that. In the place of work, if you don't compromise, if you don't sign this document, if you don't change that receipt, you're going to lose your job. Your soul is greater than that job. We're going to tell Mr. So-and-so. We're going to tell Madam So-and-so. And then they think that you're going to fear Mr. So-and-so, Madam So-and-so. So you are going to sell your soul. Your soul is greater than Madam So-and-so. Your soul is greater than Mr. So-and-so. And Jesus said, fear not them which kill the body. And are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You fear the Lord. Number two, the grievous waste of the lost soul. The grievous waste of a lost soul. Look at uh, Mark chapter 8 again. Verse 36. For what shall it profit a man? What shall it profit you? If you were to gain the whole world and lose your own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If that soul is lost, it's a great waste. The grievous waste of lost souls. We're looking at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. We're reading here from verse 16. Luke chapter 12, reading from verse 16. And he speak a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plenty for him. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to lay to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my bands and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, tell me, you know, if somebody is running after profit, after certificate, after doctorate degree, and he abandons serving God, and you call him, how about serving God, your position is there, he says, not now, not now. I have a goal, I have an ambition, I have something, I must grab that thing. So and so has got it, I must get it. I'm running after the Jones and the Jimses of the land. Whatever they have got, why? I have the same brain as they have. In fact, I think I'm better than they are. And they are running and running. If you lose your soul in that pursuit, God calls you a fool. Thou fool. Somebody help me shout, thou fool. You see, there are people, all they are running after is material gain. All they are running after is what I can have now, what I can get now. And if they are, for example, serving the Lord in the church, and maybe they are house fellowship leaders, maybe they are district pastors, maybe they are even group pastors, maybe they are overseers, and then they tell them there is an opportunity in India, there's an opportunity in America, there's an opportunity in Japan, there's an opportunity in China. And you know, the place is open now. Anyone that gets there now, because you see that country, they're trying to make some negotiation with our country, Nigeria. Anybody that gets there now, he'll just say, grab that job. And then, you know, he writes a note to the pastor and he says, I'm traveling. And when are you coming back? I don't know why I'm going to come back yet. I have a dream. I'm going to get something. If I get it in five years, maybe I come back. If it's ten years, maybe I come back. And God said, thou fool. They neglect their soul. They overlook their soul. They abandon their soul. And they are running after things that will not preserve their salvation for them. But God said unto him, thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be that thou hast provided? Verse 21, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself 
and is not rich towards God. What makes us rich towards God? Money? No. Houses? No. Certificates? No. Extramural studies? No. Children? 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 You have five, you want more yet. You have seven, you want more. And you have this. Even some people, they say, why well, I cannot remain in that their deeper life is, you know, one man, one woman. All these women that are there, who is going to marry them? Those who have not married, but they want to get a second woman and a third woman and a fourth woman. If they will allow polygamy in the church, well, the New Testament does not allow it. If they will allow it, then I will come, then I will stay. And the Bible says, God says, thou fool. Because of running after women, after polygamy, after children, after this, they leave their soul behind and they are lost. What a waste. I will not lose my soul. I will not lose my soul for money. Say it. I will not lose my soul for money. I will not lose my soul for possession. I will not lose my soul for women. Ah, look at you. I not say like me. I will not lose my soul for men. I will not lose my soul for politics. I'm not just talk, talking of politics over so there's politics in church. Politics in church. And some people, they don't care. They can throw their soul away for church politics. I will not lose my soul for politics. The gracious wealth of liberated souls. When you come to the Lord, the Lord grants you the wealth of the soul. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and I'm reading from verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, Yet, for your sakes, he became poor, that he through his poverty might be rich. He's talking about spiritual riches there. He's talking about the riches of righteousness, the riches of sanctification, the riches of Holy Ghost power, the riches of opportunities in the kingdom of God. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Thank God I have redemption. In whom we have redemption through his blood. For the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. His grace comes into our lives. Our sins are forgiven. Our souls are saved. Our names are written down in the book of life in heaven. And it says that's the wealth of the soul. It tells us in chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy, for his great love where we is, he loved us. Even when we are dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Grace, that's the riches, that's the wealth. Salvation, that's the wealth. All that grace can accomplish in our lives, that's the wealth. You will not lose your wealth. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. To whom God would make known... What is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory? Christ in you, the hope of glory. I will not miss that. I will not lose that. Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 17. Revelation chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 17. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, Because thou seest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried 
in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see as many as I love, I rebuke and chase in. Tell me the rest. Say that again. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You mean zealous, running out of money, turn around, take that same zeal, run out of salvation, run out of soul winning, run after the riches of the kingdom of God. You mean very zealous and be running after the things of this world. Take that zeal away from the things of the world and now pursue the things of God. Be zealous, therefore, and Repent. Let's come to point number three. Our incommutable watchfulness against everlasting shame. Mark chapter 8. We're reading from verse 38. Mark chapter 8. Verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me. Can you think of somebody ashamed of Christ? Was nailed to the cross for him? Stripped of his clothes on the cross for him? Wore a crown of thorns so painful for him? Just to purchase salvation for you. And of the one who has done all that, and was not ashamed of you, of your sin to bear, of your soul to cleanse, of your destiny to improve on and make you get to heaven. Can you think of anyone who will be ashamed of the Lord? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I pray you will not be ashamed of the Lord. Yes. I will not be ashamed of the Lord. Why are people ashamed? They forget Christ and they remember the person in front of them. They fear the people in front of them than they fear God. Why are people ashamed? They forget their soul. They forget their salvation. They forget the word of God. And because of that, they are ashamed to declare, I belong to Christ. I'm a saved soul. I'm a redeemed soul. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I'm on my way to heaven. Jesus is my Savior. But whosoever will be ashamed of the Lord, the Lord will be ashamed of them. Look at that verse and let's quickly talk about number one, contemptible companions ashamed in the world. Contemptible companions ashamed in the world. Look up here. It's like a man has married a woman. And she has paid the greatest price you can pay as dowry for that woman. And has closed that woman, has fed that woman, has provided shelter for that woman, has provided great opportunities for that woman. And the man has left his own family, has left everything, and has committed everything he has in the hands of that woman. And he says, you are my companion now, you are my spouse now, you are my wife now. And then as they go out in the world, the woman is ashamed of the man and doesn't want to walk with the man, live with the man does not want the public to know that this is my husband, that kind of woman contemptible companion ashamed of the bridegroom in the world is not worth any value, the same thing Christ has paid the greatest price and he is a bridegroom he is the husband and the head of the church He's left heaven, he's come to this world, and he has sacrificed everything so that we can be saved. Now you say you are saved, and now you are in the world, and you are the bride of Christ, a spouse to Christ, 
a disciple of Christ, a believer in Christ, and in the world, like that contemptible spouse, wife, companion, you are ashamed. I pray that will not happen to you. Why are people ashamed? Look at John. I'm reading from chapter 12. John chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 42. John chapter 12. We're reading from verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. They did not witness to the fact that they belonged to him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Think about it. The last time somebody confronted you, you're a child of God, and you drop your head. You're a Bible believer, you drop your head. You are born again. Tell me now. I want to be born again too. Then you are ashamed. You go to deeper life, don't you? You are a member of that church that takes every verse of the Bible serious, don't you? Tell me. Now you won't do this, you won't do that because you say you are following Christ closely and you drop your head. I pray God will forgive you. But you must repent. You must repent. You must go back to the Lord and say, Lord, I loved the praise of men, the honor of men, the appreciation of men, the favor of men, but on the praise of God. That's why you are ashamed. And it says, if you are ashamed in this adulterous and simple generation, he will be ashamed of you when he comes to, in the glory of his Father and of the holy angels. We're looking in at Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 12. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign. We'll see. If we suffer persecution, we shall also reign. We'll see. You know why some people are ashamed? They will oppress me. They will oppose me. They will criticize me. They will put some pressure on me. They will make me suffer. And they are not willing to suffer for Christ. I am willing to suffer for Christ. I said I am willing to suffer for Christ. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, tell me. If we deny him, say it now. Those who are denying the Lord and those who don't want to have the courage to stand for the Lord, those are the people that cannot say it. If we deny him, he will also deny us. You will not deny the Lord. In your place of work, you will not deny the Lord. In your extended family, you will not deny the Lord. I miss the people that say they go to church, church goers, they too, I'm, I'm born again too, I'm a gospel too, I'm this and that too, but they're still into the world. You will not be ashamed of the Lord in Jesus' name. You will stand uncompromisingly you will stand in Jesus name number one contemptible companions ashamed in the world number two corrupted compromisers ashamed of his word corrupted compromisers ashamed of his word the word of Jesus Christ is higher and greater than any other word you can hear the word of philosopher the word of a scientist, the word of a politician, the word of, uh, you know, your, the head of your human family, and the word of anyone. The words of Christ is greater, is higher, is more precious. The words of men cannot take us to heaven. It's only the word of Christ, and you will not be ashamed of the word of Christ. Look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 26. Luke chapter 9, verse 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, ashamed of me and of my words, one man, one woman, words of Christ, ashamed of me and of my words, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words. And the village people, they bring a lady. And they say, 
you are getting late. You must marry this one. Don't quote any Bible to us. Don't say, my, my church says, my church says, this one, you will marry this one. Yes or no? And then they, t they make you to sign. I will not sign Satan's paper. I said, I will not sign Satan's paper. I will not sign Satan's document. You will not sign in Jesus' name. You say, the word of the Lord commands me, I must not marry an unbeliever. And then, if your wife, if you have difficulty with your wife, and your wife is not there now, and your parents come and they say, leave that woman alone. Here is another one. And then, if your church will not agree, come out of that church and come and marry this one. Will you do that? No. I'm asking church, will you do that? No. You are not. Because the words of Jesus said, God created the male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and be joined unto his wife, only one wife, and they two shall become one. And what God has joined together, tell me. Let no relative put asunder. He says, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in, the, in his Father's and with the holy angels. You will not be ashamed of the words of the Lord in Jesus' name. But I thought that since we are now in the modern world, the words of Christ cannot be adjusted and cannot be kind of um, modified so that we're not following after the way he said it at that time. Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 35. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Are you there? Matthew chapter, tell me. 24, verse what? Heaven and earth shall pass away. As heaven passed away yet, as the earth passed away yet, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The words he spoke of righteousness, and the words he spoke, he must be born again, and the words he spoke, how we're to live in righteousness, that word is still abiding today, we will not be ashamed of the word of God in Jesus' name. Let's come to Second Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 2, verse 17. Second Corinthians, chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 17, chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. We speak the word of God. We will not corrupt the word of God in Jesus' name. Come back to Mark chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 38. Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Number three now, consecrated conquerors, unashamed in their weakness. Unashamed in their weakness. Are you ashamed? I will not be ashamed. Of the words of Christ, I will not be ashamed. Of the name of Christ, I will not be ashamed. In times of persecution, I will not be ashamed. In times of rejection, I will not be ashamed. Once you get saved, you are giving your soul to Christ. And then the world is opposing your decision. You will stand firm. And whatever they will do, whatever they will say, you will say, I belong to Christ. The grace of God will see you through. 
the power of the Holy Ghost will see you through. Your conviction will stand firm to the very end in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 5 verse 41. Acts chapter 5 verse 41. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. The same salvation they had is the same salvation we have. And if they were rejoicing, even though they were shamefully entreated, we too will rejoice. I say with you, we rejoice. We're looking at Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Say that to yourself. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Is the power of God in our lives. I will not be ashamed. Second Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. We're reading from verse 12. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 12, For which cause I also suffer these things. Have you ever suffered for the gospel? Have you suffered rejection? Have you suffered persecution? Or are you methodically practicing your Christian faith? So that you will not offend any sinner. You will not offend any backslider. You will not offend any compromiser. You want them to say good things about you. You don't want them to insult you, abuse you, criticize you. And you are methodically avoiding suffering. Those are not sincere Christians. Live your life as a child of God or to live his life. And whatever comes as a result of that your will stand. Yeah. Verse 12, For the weak cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. Say it now, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The Lord will keep you. Hebrews chapter 12, I read from verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Despising the shame. Smile at your storm. Belittle that shame. Laugh at that shame. And just show that you're happy that you're suffering for Christ. Don't cry. Don't mourn. Don't belittle yourself. Don't say, I regret. Don't say, what brought me into this? This is salvation. Your name is in the book of life in heaven. And if anybody brought you to any kind of criticism, rejoice despising the shame. And I will sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your mind. I will not faint. I'll not be weary. Those children of Israel in Egypt, the more they oppressed them, persecuted them, the stronger they became. And the more you are persecuted, the stronger you will become. First Peter chapter 4 verse 12. First Peter chapter 4 verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fairy trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, 
that when his glory shall be revealed, ye shall be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. If ye be criticized for the name of Christ, happy are ye. If ye be rejected for the name of Christ, happy are ye. I can't hear the people of God. For the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil doer, or as a busy body in other men's matters. Look at verse 16. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, if any brother, any sister suffered as a Christian, let him, tell me, let him, tell me, not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. From today, you will not be ashamed. You will follow after the Lord. And even if your stand brings persecution, criticism, rejection, opposition, you will rejoice. I will rejoice. First John chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 28. First John chapter 2, verse 28. Now, little children, abide in him. I will abide. Little children, abide in him. You are born again, abide in him. You are saved, abide in him. If you are not saved yet, tonight is the night of your salvation. You turn away from sin and you receive him and you have the joy of salvation. Your name will be written in the book of life in heaven. You will say, now I'm a child of God. It will happen to everyone in Jesus' name. And now, after you are born again, after you are saved as a new convert, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Christ is coming. He's coming for those who are saved. He's coming for those who are sanctified. He's coming for those who are consecrated. He's coming for those who are uncompromising. He's coming for those who are standing on their conviction, on the word of God. He's coming for those who are not ashamed of him here in the world. And when he comes, he will not be ashamed of you. He will say, that's mine, that's my child. He will say, that's one of the saints of God. He will not be ashamed of me. He will not be ashamed of me. He will not be ashamed of me. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. They who are sanctified are one with Christ. One mind with Christ. One heart with Christ. One spirit with Christ. One way with Christ. They who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. When he comes, he will not be ashamed of you. Where are you? I said he will not be ashamed of you. Where are you? He will not be ashamed of you. You will not be ashamed of him too. In the church, you will not be ashamed of him. Before the saints of God, you will not be ashamed of him. And when you are to serve the Lord and stand before the people of God and minister to the people of God, you will not be ashamed to serve the Lord. And when you are before believers outside your office, anywhere, they will know what you stand for. You stand for the whole Bible. I am a Bible believer. And you live according to the word of God in Jesus' name. You will not be ashamed of him. And when he comes, he will not be ashamed of you. Rise up and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, grant me the faith. Grant me the grace. Grant me the strength. Grant me the power. Grant me the ability. Grant me the conviction. I will not be ashamed. Now I can stand. 
and I can look at unbelievers like this and take my stand. I will not be ashamed. You tell the Lord, you remember the value of your soul? And you remember, if you are saved, if you are born again, abide in the Lord. And anywhere you are, live for Christ and live the life that shall Christ come today at this time. He will not be ashamed of you because you are not ashamed of him.